Hey there once again YouTube, Ben Ferriolo coming at ya. I just wanted to put out an update about the earthquake we had here in Washington State last night in the United States. It was magnitude 4.6 and woke me and my family up from uh, from sleep and it was pretty good guys. It wasn't too strong but my TV was shaking, the backboard of the bed was knocking. Woke us up because it's, you know, it, it was it's definitely enough to wake us up. It was definitely a very interesting experience. Scared the crap out of my daughter. She's like, Daddy, is that an earthquake? And we've been talking about it a lot, and she does not like earthquakes. But trying to get her a little excited about a small four-pointer, you know, a mid-range four. No damage, and just a lot of fun involved. <laughs> Seriously, didn't cause any damage. Let's have fun with it, shall we? But then again, you could, you know, it is possible this is a foreshock to a larger event, but I doubt it. I doubt it right now, but it is always possible, especially where this event was located. And I'll tell you about that in just a second. In Japan, we saw magnitude 6.1 at 251 kilometers in depth just a little over an hour ago, about two hours ago, I believe. About an hour and a half or something like that. Then down in Hawaii, we've been seeing some deep earthquakes near Pahala, Hawaii, which usually is uh, signifying spasmodic tremor, but there has been no spasmodic tremor today. These are actual earthquakes. Then an earthquake all the way to the northeast. 3.1 and 19.7 kilometers in depth. Very interesting. Very intriguing. And if we go to Kilauea Monitoring and go to, let's pick a random, let's do DESD past 24 hours. You see the P and S wave arrivals are clearly separated on the wavy quarters, showing that these pretty deep and somewhat distant from, uh, excuse me, somewhat distant from the station. They're occurring down in this location right here in the normal location where spasmodic tremor usually occurs. But no spasmodic tremor has been spotted for days, possibly even maybe... A week? Almost a week now since we've seen any spasmodic tremor, really. Maybe some little teeny, teeny, tiny ones here and there, but nothing notable. But you can tell there is somewhat of an earthquake swarm going on in that location. And yeah, so that's it for Hawaii. In the past 24 hours for all magnitudes, for the Ridge Crest area in California and the Coastal Volcanic Field area. Whoops, my bad. Let's go to Terrain. One day all magnitudes past 24 hours worth as of 7.11 p.m. Pacific Time, July 12, 2019. Coastal Volcanic Field is still seeing a seismic swarm, but it seems to be dying down a little bit. It does seem to be dying down. We still see a gap in seismicity in this area where the magma chamber is likely located. We talked about that a few videos ago. Uh, doesn't look like any type of volcanic eruption will occur. I'm not really seeing any SO2 emissions from Earth.NoSchool.net. Not seeing any volcanic tremor or low frequency earthquakes. So, at least for right now, it seems like the threat of a volcanic eruption is not there. But then again, you never know. The Earth does some crazy things. After all, the 7.1 and 6.4 uh, about a week ago was pretty crazy, nonetheless. Uh, so, going down, you see the city continues in this area. Again, about 14, or about 1,500, almost 1,500 quakes in the past 24 hours, with an interesting burst in seismicity to the east northeast of the fault zone right down here. And let's do largest magnitude first. Earlier this morning, there was a magnitude 4.9, almost a 5.0, all the way down here, right at Ridgecrest. Not actually within the volcanic field, as far to the south. Volcanic fields in this area right here. Uh, but these are aftershocks from these events. But these are a lot for aftershocks, guys. I mean, this is pretty crazy. There, they said what over thirty thousand aftershocks have been reported from the from Caltech when the data was so saturated that they couldn't report them all. So I'm going to say maybe in total of all magnitudes, even negative magnitudes, maybe even sixty thousand, maybe even seventy thousand. I mean, just the the raw power of the 6.4 and the 7.1 really did some damage to the geological features in this area. Very interesting. I'm hoping nothing else happens, but there is always a possibility. You never know, especially since we saw the 4.9 at 9.9 .9 kilometers in depth this morning. 1311 UTC, July 12, 2019. We're going to take a look at that in the Seismic Program Swarm. Let's go to the event page just real quick, and then I'll get to the Washington Earthquake and talk about that. Here is the event page for the magnitude 4.9, almost a 5.0 in the Ridgecrest area. Over almost 2,000 people reported feeling it. Likely a little bit more people did feel it. Moment Tensor suggests it was likely a strike slip earthquake, just like the many other earthquakes that have been ongoing in this area since the 4th of July. And that's it for right there. I'm going to show in the seismic program swarm. Let's see what the closest station was to this earthquake. Just real quick. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I did get a request to show this in swarm, and I will. Looks like CA03, Broadband Vertical 00 location code in the GS network. I'm going to try to pull this up in the Seismic Program Swarm. Here's the magnitude 5.0, magnitude 4.9 actually. I did not add a frequency filter yet, just wanted to see how weird this is. Check this out. 
Notice how there's nothing there at the bottom. We see this weird, and I do see this effect sometimes. I do not believe this is anywhere seismic at all because it changes. I mean, seismic data that's recorded should be constant in what you see, always. So I'm thinking this must be some type of artifact. Look at that. See that weird pulse? Look at that. Because it wasn't there prior to the earthquake, right? Right when the earthquake started, there it is right there. I think that's some type of glitch because as you'll see in just a second, this magnitude 4.9 was pretty strong. And let's go to the waveforms, shall we? And right there. Right there. Notice how it is very strange looking when it's unfiltered. Let's add a 1 hertz high pass filter, shall we? There we go. There's the magnitude 4.9, almost a 5.0 in the Ridgecrest area, likely occurring as part of aftershocks ongoing from the intense earthquake activity that still is continuing. Magnitudes are getting a little bit smaller. Not as many high threes and fours occurring anymore, but that could change. That could definitely always change. I've seen a lot of earthquakes, a lot of earthquakes, guys. Crazy amount of earthquakes still, regardless of magnitude. I mean, they're pretty much almost still constantly occurring. But yeah, so that's the magnitude 4.9. Whoops, my bad. 4.9, right up here. Let's go back up. Here's the seismic waveforms once again to that 4.9. Now let's move on to some information about the magnitude 4.6 that I felt last night. So there have been about 15 reported aftershocks after this magnitude 4.6 that jolted us awake last night. Apparently they're now saying it's 28.8 kilometers in depth, almost 30 kilometers, which would explain why it was felt so far away. Sometimes if an earthquake, let's say a 4.6 occurred right at the surface, of course it'd be pretty strong in the area centralized around the, uh, the epicenter. But if it's a little bit deeper, it won't be as strong at the epicenter, but it will be felt farther away from the epicenter. You know what I'm trying to say? This magnitude 4.6 again occurred in the northwestern section of Monroe. Now I want you to know something that I think is very important. We have a 3.5, 31 kilometers in depth just two minutes after the 4.6 that jolted us awake. And this magnitude 2.0 up here, which occurred at about 2.31 p.m. Pacific time today, I believe I felt that because I was on the couch, and apparently there were some people in the Seattle area that reported feeling this 2.0 at 27.9 kilometers in depth. I was on the couch watching the 5, and um, and about 2.31, it was at, basically right at the same time because I remember my kids said something, I forget what they said, and then the 5 came on, and I remember it was about 2.31, 2.32, right around there. It felt like like someone was walking behind me really hard or like running, you know, you know, like when you feel the ground shaking when someone runs really fast, but there's no sounds of running. I'm used to people running upstairs because we live in a condo and we're on the third floor. So shaking will be a little bit stronger for us up here than down below. Um, so I think I did feel this. I submitted a felt report. So hopefully that was seen by USGS because I believe I did feel this 2.0. So I possibly felt two earthquakes in the past 24 hours. Don't know for sure if I did, but the timing matches up perfectly. Now I want you to notice something about this area. Let's go to Wikipedia. I usually don't use Wikipedia a lot, but this was some great information that I did check out. And I want you to notice what this is right here. I don't know if you could see it very well. My computer's lagging once again. Now right here is where I live, right? Right in this location, right where you see the red, uh, is right where, and apparently there's some basaltic rock in this area from an old, old, very, very ancient basaltic eruption called Lord Hill. That is one of my, one of my friends on, uh, Facebook actually told me it was a hiking post. USGS does not have much about Lord Hill, but it was a hiking post for hikers that go up there, right? In that area, and apparently it was formed, it's an old, very, very, very ancient basaltic ridge, which I thought was very interesting. Basaltic, obviously, that's magma, uh, but very, very, very old lava right there. Very, very old. Definitely, probably nothing could ever come up in that area ever again. You never know, though. But we're focusing on this fault right here. You see it extends all the way down here past Snohomish, right, or into Snohomish, I believe. I live right there. The earthquake occurred right on the north, northeastern section just a little bit north northeast of the South Whidbey Island Fault. And look how long it is. See the Seattle Fault right here, which is capable of a magnitude 7.1. The Seattle, or the, excuse me, the South Whidbey Island Fault goes all the way to the northwest, all the way into the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Do you see how long that thing is? That is a massive, massive fault. Now let's read about it just real quick. The Southern Whidbey Island Fault, which is possibly responsible for last night's earthquake, it's very, very possible, is a significant terrain boundary manifested as an approximately four mile wide zone of complex transpressional 
faulting with at least three strands. Marine seismic reflection surveys show it striking northwest across the eastern end of the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Just south of Victoria, British Columbia, it intersects the west striking Devil's Mountain Fault and either merges with it or crosses and possibly truncates it uh, to connect with the Leech River Fault. The Leech River Fault has been identified as the northern edge of the Crescent Formation, aka Mechosin Formation, part of the Silesia terrain that underlies much of western Washington and Oregon. Seismic tomography studies, which is mapping underground, show that this portion of the SWIF marks a strong contrast of seismic velocities, such as is expected of crescent formation basalts in contact with the metamorphic basement rocks of the Cascades Geological Province to the east. Basalts. To the southeast of the SWIF passes through Admiralty Inlet, past Port Townsend, and across the southern part of Whidbey Island, crossing to the mainland between Muckleteo and Edmonds. And for the locals in western Washington around the Seattle, Everett area, you guys know where I'm talking about. This section of the SWIF forms the southwestern side of the Everett Basin, which is most notably aseismic in that essentially no shallow, less than 12 kilometers deep, earthquakes have occurred there or on the section of the SWIF adjoining it in the first 38 years of instrumental recording. And of course, we know the earthquake that occurred all the way in this location was much deeper than 12 kilometers. It was almost about 30 kilometers. Yet it is also notable that most seismicity in the northern Puget Sound occurs along and southwest of the southern Whidbey Island Fault at typical depths of 15 to 27 kilometers in depth, with last night's being about 28.8 kilometers in depth, within the lower part of the Crescent Formation. The contrast of seismic velocities seen to the northwest is lacking in this section, suggesting that it is not the coast range cascade contact. The significance of this, whether the edge of the crescent formation and implicity of the sweats terrain turned southward, blah, 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 metamorphic basement, supplanted here by other volcanic rock is not known. It has been suggested that a corresponding change in the character of the SWIF may reflect a change in the direction of regional crustal strain. Prior to 2000, prominent aeromagnetic anomalies strongly suggested that the fault zone continued southeast, down that way perhaps as far as the town of Duval. But this was uncertain as the w SWIF is largely concealed and the faint surface traces generally obliterated by urban development. Since the 2000 studies of LIDAR and high-resolution aeromagnetic data have identified scarps near Woodenville. That's right. Guys, I can walk to Woodenville from here. Which trenching has confirmed to be tectonically derived and geologically recent. Subsequent mapping shows the SWIF wrapping around the eastern end of the Seattle Basin to merge with the Rattlesnake Mountain Fault Zone. The RMFZ, despite the approximately 15 degree bend in different contexts, is now believed to be the southern extension of the SWIF. Reckoned between Victoria and approximately Falls City, the length of the SWIF is around 90 miles. <laughs> 90 miles. Are you, that is a huge, that is a massive fault, guys. That is huge. That's, that, I, I'm gonna say that's probably one of the biggest in Western Washington. Yeah. Now, guys, listen to what comes next. It has been suggested that the SWIF might extend past its intersection with, with the RF, RMFC, with only peripheral strands turning to join the RMFC to cross the Cascades and eventually merge with or cross the Olympic Wall lineament. A uh, study of regional features suggests such a pattern, but detailed mapping just past the intersection shows only a complex and confused pattern of faulting, with no indication that there is or is not through going faulting. Mapping of areas further east that may clarify the pattern is not currently planned, but they know it's 90 miles long. <laughs> it has been, oh, whoops, paleoseismological, okay, this is the important part, check this out. Paleoseismological studies of the SWIF are scanned. One study compared the relative elevation of two marshes on opposite sides of Whidbey Island and determined that approximately 3,000 years ago, an earthquake of 6.5 to 7.0 caused 1 to 2 meters of uplift. Woo-wee! Another study identified an unusually broad band of scarps passing between Bothell, hey, that's where I live, and Snohomish, with several scarps in the vicinity of King County's controversial Brightwater Regional Sewage Treatment Plant, 
showing at least four and possibly nine events on the SWIF in the past 16,400 years. And it's been 3,000 years since the last major event on the SWIF. Wow. Such seismic hazards were a major issue in the sitting of the, in the siting of the plant, as it is tucked between two active strands in the influent and effluent pipelines across multiple zones of disturbed ground. Now guys, I did not know. Okay, so I knew about the south, uh, southern Woodby Island fault. I thought it was just this. Right here. I had no clue it stretched from the Strait of Juan de Fuca, 90 miles to the southeast, down here near Snohomish. Wow. And I mean, wow. Yeah, I just found this out today doing research about last night's earthquake, guys. I'm not saying that we're going to see a big one soon, but I'm just saying it has been 3,000 years, which is much longer than what the Seattle Fault has seen. The Seattle, uh, excuse me, Seattle Fault ruptured with about a 7.1 about 1,100 years ago. Yeah, very, very intriguing. Now, I found something very, very intriguing. Uh, USGS does have scenario event pages. These are event pages for earthquakes that did not occur. This event is a scenario. It did not occur. It should only be used for planning purposes. Okay, so this is a scenario for a magnitude 7.5, which is what the Southern Woodby Island Fault is capable of. Yes, a 7.5 right right up the street from me. I mean, if I wanted to go drive onto the top of the fault, I think it'd take maybe 10 minutes from where I live. Yeah, maybe 10, 15 minutes max. Actually, no, wait, I'm going to say probably just 10 minutes because it said it went through Monroe, right? And down near Snohomish. That's not that far from me, guys. So, yeah, I did not know this fault was here. I knew the Seattle fault was kind of close to me, but this is by far the largest and closest fault next to where I live, and it's right in my backyard. So I wanted to take a look at this. I have not looked at this much, but we're going to look at it together. They're saying this, this uh, scenario earthquake was a 7.5 and 9 kilometers in depth. This is an area of likely what would happen if most of the Southern Woodby Island Fault ruptured. Let's go right here. Okay, so let's say the earthquake occurred along the South Woodby Island Fault in this direction, with most of it rupturing probably in this location right here. Severe, extreme, damaging. Yeah, you want to know right where I, well not really right where I live, but I want to tell you the general location right there. Right there. Right in the center of the strongest shaking from a rupture of the south, southern Whidbey Island Fault region. Yeah. I did not know this fault existed until today, guys. Uh, no joke. No joke. I had no clue. I knew the southern Whidbey Island Fault was real. I had no freaking clue that it was actually this large. Yeah. So, let's hope that doesn't happen for a very long time. Let's just hope. What's that? Let's see, PGV, don't know what that is. Very interesting. Metadata. Hmm. So, yeah, guys, apparently it's capable of a magnitude 7.5. And again, I'm not saying that's going to happen. But I do think it is very, very intriguing that they do have a scenario earthquake for that fault, which is the closest and largest fault to me. <laughs> again, here's the magnitude 4.6 that jolted us awake last night. Pretty, pretty strong earthquake, guys. It was very, very intriguing. Lasted, I'm going to say the shaking here was mild to moderate and lasted about 10 to 12 seconds. Maybe 15 seconds. I don't know. I wasn't counting because I got up. I was like, earthquake! Uh, but the thing is, is it lasted a good amount of time. I did not feel the 3.5 aftershock. I probably would have if I wasn't freaking out and really excited. Because uh, I was kind of running around for about five minutes like a headless chicken. Going, oh my god, we had an earthquake! Woohoo! And then there are a few aftershocks, few aftershocks, few aftershocks. And let's see here, a few aftershocks, one right there. And then later on, I think I felt this 2.0 aftershock right here. I think I did. I can't say if I did for sure, but it has some pretty strong S waves. And I only felt the shaking very, very, very weak. But I was sitting still. Felt like someone was running behind me for a few seconds, but no one was. No one was upstairs running. I think they're at work and the kids are at daycare. Uh, but yeah, so I think I did feel this aftershock too, I believe. So, that's pretty interesting, guys. I hope you all stay safe. Remember, always have a plan ready. You never know when anything might hit, and it's not just volcanic eruptions we have to watch out for, guys. It's basically everything. You should always be prepared and plan, and never be scared. Be prepared. God bless. Hope you guys have a great day, and I'll see you later.